Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Kambiz Ranavardi, co-president of Columbia DC and a graduate of a School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, first, let me thank our partners for this event, uh, the Brown uh, University Club of Washington DC and their members for joining uh, us tonight. We are very privileged and honored to have uh, Professor Jessica Bruder uh, and Professor Dale Maharaj, both teaching at Columbia Journalism School with us to talk about stories behind Nomadland, Surviving America in the 21st Century, uh, which is the title of uh, Bruder's most recent uh, highly acclaimed book, uh, which has uh, gone to become a, uh, a, a Oscar winning movie, as many of you know. So please allow me to introduce our speakers, uh, but I do encourage everyone to check our website for their full bios and, and uh, their uh, other incredible works. Jessica Bruder is uh, a narrative journalist who writes about social issues and subcultures. Her best selling book, Nomadland named a New York Times uh, notable book and editor's choice won the 2017 Discover Award and was a finalist for the J. Anthony Lucas Prize and the Helen uh, Bernstein Book Award. Bruder is also the author of Burning Book and uh, the co-author with Professor Maharaj of Snowden's Box, Trust in the Age of Surveillance. She has written for several publications such as uh, New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, and The Washington Post. She has been teaching at Columbia Journalism School since 2008. Our host, uh, Dale Maharaj, has been teaching at uh, the Journalism School since 2001. He was visiting professor at the Stanford for 10 years, and before that, he has spent 15 years as a newspaper man writing for Cleveland Plain Dealer, The Sacramento Bee, and other publications. His most, uh, most of his books are illustrated uh, with the work of photographer Michael Williamson. Journey to Nover, uh, the saga of the new underclass inspired Bruce Springsteen to write two songs. And it was uh, reissued in 96 with uh, actually an introduction uh, by, the, by the boss himself. Another one of his books uh, and their children after them won the, the Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 1990. So without further ado, Dale, uh, uh, Jessica, it's all yours. Great, great to be here. Um, I'm in my office at Columbia University in New York City and Jess is somewhere quite different. Tell us where you are, Jess. Um, I'm in Wells, Nevada and it's really hot here. I, I'm trying to figure out, I hope my, uh, I've got the air conditioning in the van running. So hopefully the rumble of the engine is not too loud. Uh, let me know if I need to turn it off and just sweat because I can do that. Uh, it's hot out here. I'm in um, my 1995 GMC Vandora van uh, named Halen. It's the same van I did uh, most of the reporting for Nomadland in, and I'm actually getting it back out for the first time since the pandemic began, which is a thrill. Thank you, Pfizer. Great, yes, you know, hooray for vaccines and great to be on the road. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and you're, 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 the van was stored in Reno, and you're, you're heading to Colorado, I believe, and then points, I don't know where you're going. You're always going somewhere, Jess. Um, tell us how this started. You were not in a van when this project started. Let's go way back. Let's even go before you even hit the road. How did you hear about the, the idea or get the idea for Nomadland? Yeah, so, so I, I do a lot of reading. I'm, I'm a journalist, and I teach, and it, it's part of what I do. Um, and it came to my attention, gosh, almost a decade ago, that Amazon had developed this kind of itinerant labor force called Camper Force, which uh, based on these group pictures they used to take, I surmised was made up of almost entirely at or nearing retirement age white people. Um, and was, they were just basically doing seasonal labor. So they were living full time in vans and RVs. And then around the holiday shopping season, they would show up and Amazon would get them a parking spot and they would do what really seemed like difficult work. I mean, this was when we were first hearing about uh, the rigors of Amazon's uh, warehouse jobs from the morning call in Pennsylvania, that newspaper that told us about the warehouse where people were passing out and they had to call paramedics, but they wouldn't open the doors or turn on air conditioning. And they basically just had paramedics stationed there. And there was a cover on Mother Jones about 
uh, an, an undercover piece. Somebody went into a warehouse uh, that was Gabe McClelland. And when uh, somebody approached the reporter and said, I'm part of a program called Camper Force. I work here because I can't afford to retire. And I said, wait, what's going on? And kind of rewinded it mentally from there, uh, learned that there was a whole group of people like them uh, and ended up reporting that story for Harper's Magazine. I went out to Quartzay, Arizona with a tent and a rental car and stayed for two weeks talking to just about everyone I could find. Yeah, and that was in the winter because I know why it was in the winter. You called me from that tent and I could hear your teeth chattering from the cold. So the van was a big improvement once you got, once you got it. It's kind of an ice box in the winter too, but it definitely keeps the wind off, which is very nice. Uh, it, is, it is good shelter. It's hard to heat at night because you can't run a, po a propane heater and sleep if you're not really well vented. Um, so uh, right now, uh, with spring and summer weather out here, it's fantastic. Oh, great. Well, some of those who are uh, in the uh, audience who saw Nomadland have already met Linda May. They have a sense of who Linda May is. She's really the central character in the book. Um, tell, explain how you met her and you know, why did she let you into her life so deeply? It's, it's an amazing uh, thing that you, you, you did, get that close and intimate with her, her life. Yeah, so um, I met Linda uh, by happenstance, just like how I meet a lot of people. Linda actually wasn't uh, the person I planned to write about in the beginning when I was working on that Harper's story. Um, that person was one of the only people I interviewed in, gosh, probably at least five dozen interviews with Amazon warehouse workers. And he actually got hired full time. And he said that if he appeared in the press, he'd probably get the ACS or the Amazon cold shoulder. And his tag wouldn't work uh, when he went to check in for work anymore. Uh, and I didn't want that to happen to him. And I needed to find someone else to write about. And I was running around and I felt like I was kind of auditioning people for main character. And uh, one of the last people I met was Linda. She had just gotten out on the road in a class C RV. She'd worked at Amazon. She'd done another job campground hosting. She had taken to the road when she realized that her social security was only going to amount to about 500 a month, not even enough to pay the rent. And she had never gotten a pension or anything like that. Didn't really have enough to retire. Hoped to hit the road, save up and, and maybe buy a plot of land of her own. Um, when I met Linda, she was amazing from the beginning. She was telling me about her dreams of homesteading, of building something called an earthship. And for me, as a narrative writer, that, that gave something to work with, that gave me some clay because she had a mission and she was going to pursue it and I could follow that. And thankfully she never kicked me out. I think I drank a lot of her coffee. Well, it's interesting. I see in the background your table. That table came into your reporting very, very handily, as I recall. Which what? table? Your table where you sat and interviewed people. Oh, that's, you can't see that. That's way in the back where the anarchy is. Oh, okay. I'm not, okay. It looks <laughs> like I'm seeing the table. Okay. Yeah, no, in the that's, back, that's, that that's, a, that's a countertop. Um, it's crazy back there. Mike, mice attacked the van uh, during its COVID hibernation. And I spent about five or six hours uh, outside a car wash yesterday, just doing serious vacuuming and sterilizing. So I'm a little behind, which is why I'm speaking to you from the road today. Yeah. So you sat at that table and interviewed people like Linda uh, in, in Quartzsite and other places where, where you work. You, you kind of followed people around all over the West. Uh, sure did. Uh, as I like to say, uh, we, we, the kind of journalism that you and I do, we drive for a living. Uh, that's our job description. And then once in a while, we stop and talk to people. Um, but you were up at the Sugar Beet Harvest. You were out down in Quartzsite. Talk about some of those jobs. You did some of the jobs that the people you write about did. Uh, yeah, I, I did what I understand to be the two most physically difficult jobs uh, and the two that pay the most, although that's not so much. I don't have today's figures on that, by the way. Um, so I did the sugar beet harvest and I did Amazon's camper force. And for Amazon's camper force, I was down in, gosh, near, I was a, about a half an hour outside of um, Dallas, Fort Worth. And I was working at the warehouse there. Um, and it was wild. I was definitely uh, I, I, the only person in my age bracket there because I was in my 30s back then. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was amazing to see the warehouse from the inside, from the perspective of people who are going there every day. Um, I also did the annual sugar beet harvest that was up in North Carolina's Red River Valley near the Canadian border. And that was probably the most exhausting job I've ever done. Um, and it blew my mind because everybody who was doing it 
was either under 30 and pretty much a crust punk or traveling kid or dirty kid as they call themselves or over 60. Uh, so I was in this in-between zone and I just couldn't imagine being older and doing it. Um, just because you're on your feet for about 12 hours a day, again, on concrete. Uh, we had to shovel these beets that were spilling out of uh, haul trucks uh, into these hoppers. When they missed, we had to climb into this machine and clean it out. And it made me think of Charlie Chaplin. The yeah, beets sorry, were like, The beets were huge. These aren't little beets you buy in the store. These were no. like 20 and 30 pound um, uh, monsters. Yeah, maybe not quite that heavy, but they were, we, every now and then we'd see one basically the size of a basketball. That's how they would max out. Otherwise, uh, maybe the size of like a pomelo, which looks like a giant grapefruit. Um, one of the things we had to do was take samples, which meant you grab a vinyl bag that's like a big pillowcase and you push a button and the beats come rocketing down to shoot probably 15 feet overhead and you're catching them. And it feels like you're catching turkeys in a pillowcase. Um, and I've got a slightly messed up shoulder. So everything that night, every injury I've ever had after the first night, um, every every injury in my body was just kind of coming back and screaming at me. Everything I thought I'd healed uh, just kind of rose to the surface. I don't think I've ever heard you so tired when you called me at the end of a shift. You could barely yeah. talk. Uh, it's really hard work. And the reason you did the work wasn't just to, you know, I don't know, uh, for, for, for a lark. You want to know, understand what people who were in their 60s and 70s are doing to survive in America uh, at these jobs, these seasonal jobs. Talk a little bit about that and the warehouse work. Yeah, um, and I, I really did want to see the jobs from the inside. I actually don't prefer to go undercover. Some people think it's sexy. I don't really think so. Um, but both the Sugar Beet Harvest and Amazon were closed work sites, and I had no way to access them just as an outside observer. Um, in a way that would work. So um, yeah, so did both of those and um, how do I even explain it? In terms of seeing people in the workplace, um, gosh, I remember being in the warehouse with a gentleman in his seventies who'd been a mechanic in um, the copper mines for much of his life and his knees were completely shot. And during orientation, we were told that our job would involve a lot of stooping and lifting. Uh, and this woman said, buns of steel, here we come. It was a, uh, a reference to that 80s workout video. And I just kept thinking, oh my God, this guy isn't gonna make it. Um, so a lot of these jobs are really difficult. They're not the kind of jobs we associate with older bodies, but in America right now, our social safety net is so threadbare. And even for a lot of seniors who we think are typically, you know, uh, I, I think the stereotype out there is that people are better off then say millennials and there's the whole okay boomer thing. But the people I met were really working their butts off and having a pretty hard time getting by. Mm. And and you start the book. Now the, the one thing about the film Nomadland is uh, to me it's very true to the book in terms of many of the things you see on the screen you experienced in and were based all on real life. The book starts in Empire, uh, the town uh, uh, where they made sheetrock forever for generations. Uh, and it, you did a story about that town long before this, this project even started. It was the last company town in America. Uh, talk a little bit about that and how, how, uh, how that, inf how that wh why you, you decided to start the book with that, with that dead town. Yeah, sure. So uh, that town wasn't originally supposed to be part of the project at all. It was a story I did in 2011 for the Christian Science Monitor when I found out that this tiny town, Empire, Nevada, which was a company town in the truest of senses in that the company owned all the tract housing. It was in the middle of nowhere. They paid for your water. They paid for everything. It was like the company kind of in loco parentis um, and pictures from there looked like a Norman Rockwell painting. They looked like they'd come out of the fifties or something. And because company towns were already an outdated model and because the 2008 housing crash just changed everything. Um, the town shut down. I mean, the town was dedicated to making drywall. There was a gypsum mine and a factory. And with construction drying up, the demand wasn't there. There was also a glut of Chinese drywall on the market. Uh, and that was really the death blow to this town, um, which I learned they were basically just gonna encircle with a fence. And it was going to, you know, pretty much merge with the desert, the surrounding desert, it sounded like. Um, and in my mind, this was just, this incredible look at 
uh, just an incredible opportunity to look at a place that was existentially threatened by these market forces and what it meant to the people who lived there. Uh, but it's funny how those stories stay with you. The guy who hugs Francis in the first scene of the movie is somebody uh, I met on that 2011 uh, project and have spoken with many times since. Actually, his wife just saw that I was in Nevada and I already got the Facebook text like, when are we gonna see you? Are you coming up? And I feel really guilty I'm not going that way, but we got history. No, like many of these kind of projects to kind of start organically and then they grow and morph and change. And But when you get into something like this, like when you were deep in it, uh, it, it was hard uh, uh, emotionally. I, I'll never forget, you bought Van Halen. We were at my uncle and aunt's place in uh, California and we put the solar panels on the roof that day, uh, hooked up your batteries, basically made a mini solar system. Uh, I have an off-the-grid house, or I had an off-the-grid house in, in Northern California. Basically, we made a mini a mini system for you. But when you drove off, I'll never forget, uh, I felt a pit in my stomach. You know, it was scary for me to see you going off on this very deep uh, journey. And it's not just physical danger, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but the psych psychological immersion that you do when you get to know people like Linda and Swanky. Uh, it's, it's not easy work because you're getting people who are, who are struggling to survive and, and you're trying to you know, document their lives um, and you get so close to them, you, you kind of become part of it. And I, I, I got a sense that happened to you a little bit as you went along the way. Yeah, well, to revisit the moment you were talking about when I was leaving your uncle's, wow, was I freaked out. I mean, that was probably one of the strangest moments. I mean, we had just gotten the van fixed. I still couldn't drive the van without having my shoulders up to my ears. Um, it's 19 feet long and weighs more than four tons. And I know that because I did put it on a truck scale out of curiosity. Um, and I remember driving it down your uncle's steep, steep driveway. I knew I was going back to Quartzsite, Arizona. I had no idea where I was going to park and who I would stay with once I got there. I just knew I had um, a book to write and more reporting to do. Uh, and Swanky did end up taking me into her camp. But I feel like, and it's hard to, to explain this to our students, Dale, but a lot of what we do and we end up doing is making plans, but then improvising, right? And I, I think it's common nowadays, at least for students to want to plan something to death to the point where there's more planning than there is doing. And the best projects I have have are when it's just kind of, you make yourself jump in the pool and then you have to swim. Uh, and that's really what it felt like that night. I remember just, uh, I missed you very quickly. I missed uh, being with warm company, uh, knowing where I was going. Everything went uh, from seeming somewhat well-organized to chaotic in about five minutes. And now thinking about it, there's this novelty song that uh, I can't explain to everybody, but we, we, Dale and I have this novelty song we like, and the chorus goes something like, this was fun, but now it's... Yes. Not. not. <laughs> <laughs> we sing it a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and it, it and it also, you know, Linda was pretty open, but Swanky at first, and this is often common, she kind of rejected you. She wasn't going to even talk to you. So talk about Swanky a little bit. And, I think you're thinking about Levon. Swanky was actually oh, pretty cool with me. Levon, I'm sorry, I'm conflating. Was less, Swanky was less cool with Chloe, the filmmaker, because she had a shoulder injury and just didn't want to get involved with anything. Uh, Levon. <laughs> Linda's best friend, the first time I uh, approached her, she was having a breakfast gathering uh, at an event called the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous. And uh, I showed up with a box of a dozen eggs. And of course, people had already brought like hundreds of eggs. It was like bringing a, a teaspoon of salt water to the ocean. And I, I put them down feeling sheepish. And she said, oh, I've heard about you. You're the reporter. You're going to make us out to look like a bunch of homeless vagabonds. And I just felt my heart fall into my stomach. And I feel like when you arguing with that, it just doesn't really help. If somebody has that impression, uh, the second you engage, it's kind of like she doth protest too much. Um, in my situation, I don't like to push people to talk. I like to explain what I'm up to and then kind of step back. Um, so that's what I did. I stepped away, I ate some eggs. Um, and a couple days later, uh, when I hadn't left, um, she ended up telling me pretty much her whole story. So uh, a lot of it is what I call PDO, uh, PD, ah, PDO, productive hanging out. So no, that would just be PO. 
P-H-O. I don't know. I'm sorry. I was going to get iced coffee before this, but then I couldn't get my phone on the internet. So you have to forgive my rambling. Well, P-O, but just don't peel off people. That's all. You don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. I'm uncaffeinated. So. Uncaffeinated and long driving uh, on the road. Yeah. That, I, I, that, uh, Halen is not easy to drive, even after you've done it for a while. We, we, it's I it's found like that exercise. Was... I'm going to have arms like Michelle Obama by the time I'm done with this haul. So. And which comes to the to the to the physical danger factor, not just physical danger, but um, because you're you are kind of protected in the van, but the knock, and, and the knock. that first night you you slept in Halen, uh, outside of uh, I think Linda May's place, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I was trying to play it cool, like I'd done it before, because Linda was staying with her daughter, and you know it, it felt like every square inch of that apartment was spoken for. She had a granddaughter who had converted a, uh, a walk-in closet to a bedroom. Linda was on the couch. So while they offered to have me inside, there was no way I was going to do that. But I hadn't slept in a van in anywhere I wasn't supposed to sleep in a van just yet. And I had remembered reading a bunch about people's first experiences on the road and how nervous people felt that first night. I didn't expect to feel it because for me, this was reporting. This wasn't real life. This was uh, something I did and then I'd go back home to Brooklyn and uh, and I was nervous as all get out. Uh, it didn't help that I had just been bit in the leg with a chihuahua uh, before that, before I kind of <laughs> tried to bed down. Uh, I, that was another this was fun but now it's not moment where I was like, uh, what if it broke the skin? What if I'm gonna get rabies? Um, the mind reels. Um, but in any case, when I, um, when I was lying there, I just remember watching the headlights kind of strafe and kind of doppel around the van, just first the white ones, then the red ones, as every car passed. And as every car passed, I would wonder, is it slowing? Are they going to get out and bug me? Can they tell I'm in here? Will they call the police? Because I did know that all van dwellers know the knock, which is, it's like, it's like those three sharp fangs on the side of your van. And usually there's a police officer on the other side asking you to move along. So I really didn't want that to happen. Uh, it didn't, but that didn't make sleeping any easier that first night. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on in America. Towns have passed, I, I, I lost count how many towns have passed laws forbidding car camping, uh, many, many people. I was in Los Angeles working last summer and uh, there's dedicated parking lots for people living out of their vehicles, uh, some just for women. Um, and it's just, it's amazing how, um, uh, uh, it's become normalized, people living out of their cars, but it's also been demonized at the same time. Uh, and a lot of these people are women. And this is something that I noticed I, in 40 years of covering this, this, this story of the working class. When I started out in the 19, early 1980s, it was just men on the road. You didn't see women. Um, mm -hmm. And a and matter of fact, the first book I did, I was criticized. There's no women in your book. Because by the time the book came out in 85, you were starting to see women come, come on the road. But now, as you found, oh my gosh, it's it's a huge community of women. Um, and explain why women are, are, are even more at a disadvantage than men. And I don't mean, I mean, economically, let's just talk about their, their backstory. Yeah, in terms of seeing older women on the road, I saw a ton of them. And it surprised me a bit at first. And then uh, over time, it didn't surprise me at all anymore because women outlive men. We still have a significant gender pay gap. So women have lower lifetime earnings than men. That means lower social security. They also social security. They also take time out of the workforce to do the unpaid caregiving that is a sort of labor, but still usually falls on women and does not remunerate them. Um, so there are all these reasons why people are on the road. And for a lot of people in the generation I was meeting, uh, when they were growing up, somebody who earned minimum wage and worked full time could support a whole family, even lift that family out of poverty. And usually that was going to be the guy. And, you know, the roles were different. So, you know, stuff happens, people die, people get divorced. And a lot of these women ended up in a pretty unfamiliar world pretty quickly. Uh, and they were doing the best they can out there. So when I was with you in Quartzsite a few years ago, we went to the job fairs um, and they have there for, for people. And the kind of jobs people do, not, you know, Amazon warehouses are one level of job, but many are campground hosts. And 
other other kind of jobs, uh, 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 tour guides and, and such, seasonal tourist tour, tour guides. Uh, and Linda worked for Etic as a campground host. Uh, you know, what's the pay like? I mean, what? Okay, you're 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 homeless and you're 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 in your sixties or seventies and you're working these jobs. What kind of money do people make in a given year? Well, then and now, it's funny, I, I don't, as I was saying earlier, have the latest pay stats because I know, for example, Linda May was working in California and I the minimum wage has gone up. But then I think she was making $8 and change an hour, maybe nine, nine and change. Uh, but the weird thing about that campground hosting kind of work is that even though it's not reflected on your timesheet, you're always on the clock because a campground host is essentially a combination between... Um, you know, they, they, they put you in a uniform that kind of makes you look like a ranger. So you're basically enforcement, you're correcting camping fees, you're breaking up arguments, you're shoveling out fire pits, you're checking people in, you're cleaning the toilets over and over, you're cleaning the toilets uh, and doing all sorts of stuff. And because you're living on site, people come to you um, at all hours uh, with whatever they need. And that happens all the time. And there are also projects that go over time. And I talked to so many people who were not getting compensated for the number of hours that they worked. They're, they actually, some of them had submitted complaints uh, to the Department of Labor in California. And, and when I, uh, I actually ended up calling national parks and saying, what do you do when you get these, um, these complaints? Or it had to be the Forest Service. And they said, well, we pass them back to the concessionaires. And those are the private companies that are hiring these people. And I thought that was really scary that the people, you know, these are our public lands in many cases and often uh, our access to them is built on exploited labor. And when that's brought to the federal government's attention, nobody seems to care. And the Amazon uh, warehouse work is, is how many miles? I think you, some, I've read or you calculated, you're, walk, you're walking miles on concrete. And the no, work I, I wasn't, I, I was in an older warehouse. So what I did a lot of, like the, the physical work is still there. It just gets to uh, displaced. So in a newer warehouse, like where I was, the robots come and bring you the merch. So you're doing a lot of lifting and stooping, which was okay for me, but not for somebody with older joints. In what they call the legacy warehouses, legacy means old in corporate slang. Uh, those were the only ones that existed when I started reporting before they were using the robots. People walked as many as 15 miles a day on concrete and they would wear Fitbits and figure it out. They, they brought in, um, they, you know, just little pedometers and stuff like that. And they would make light of it by saying, you know, Amazon is my free gym or my uh, cat food lifting weight loss program or something like that. But, you know, that seemed a little bit like what people nowadays might call toxic positivity. Just, um, you know, they were making light of it and saying, hey, well, I'm getting in shape, but the truth is it's really hard work and especially on older bodies. I knew, I knew a bunch of people who got injured. Right. Linda May had a repetitive stress injury that was really bad when I met her. Wow, uh, yeah, I know. I think she, didn't she have her hands in splints at one point? Yeah, there's an amazing uh, picture that the photographer Max Whitaker took when I did the Harper story that led to the book. So it's in Harper's Magazine and you just see her wrist and sorry, there's a little glare here. Uh, one of them has this brace on it that she had to wear after working for Amazon. You've got glare and I have New York sirens in the background a little bit ago. Uh, We've hey, got it all. <laughs> got it all. Um, uh, so, you know, some people wanted, you, you know, the movie to take Amazon more to task. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's in the movie, it's a background. You know, it doesn't yeah. really have the, the, what they're making. It's just, you just see the, the, the grueling work, but you don't really get, understand. And some people are critical of that. And how do you feel about that criticism? Um, it's pretty meta. I mean, one of the things that frustrates me right now about the left is I feel like uh, we can become a bit of a circular firing squad in terms of who has pledged deeper and greater fealty to the cause. I mean, obviously, I have very, very strong feelings about Amazon. If you've read the book, you know that or some of my other work. But when the project started, I was fully aware that this was going to be a fictionalized Hollywood film. Um, and it wasn't going to make all the same choices that I did. Uh, I was not involved with the screenwriting. I, you know, I, I, I supplied a lot of general research, but you know, it wasn't up to me to vet the screenplay. Um, so I wasn't pissed off about it. And when it started getting a lot of coverage that people 
said, oh, th there was more of this in the book. Um, part of me wishes that people were venting that frustration in the direction of Amazon rather than the direction of the film. Because again, that was the circular firing squad moment. I was like, let's bottle all this energy uh, and take this into talking more about the union effort and what Amazon did to squash that. And we, you know, there are just so many things we could talk about that I think actually might be more productive. So that's where I come down on it right now, at least. Now ask me again tomorrow. Right. Well, the film, you know, uh, it's 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 larger than life. I mean, uh, uh, you you if you make it a straight in film, then you lose a lot of audience. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in agreement with not making it a heavy part of the film, but there, there has been that criticism. And yeah, and I, I think you can't avoid being political, whether you're doing a book or writing a film, because if you think you're avoiding it, I mean, that's water we're all swimming in. If you think you're avoiding it, you're just embracing the status quo. And I, I think the movie did capture the spirit of the book, and I don't think it had to wave a picket sign to do it. So uh, right. I'm grateful that, it, that they got there, period. Well, I feel the movie was very true to the book in a good way. Some some films are true to books and it's not good, a good idea. But in this case, and the fact that, that Chloe Zhao mixed real people like Bob Wells and, and Swanky and Linda, and it, to me, the interspersing of, of the re reality, the documentary film uh, almost, and the fiction was, was a brilliant way to get this story out there to the world. Um, you didn't expect to have happen what happened, obviously. Uh, I think if I'd have told you it's going to uh, the, f the film on your book will win a, an Oscar, I think you'd have you'd have kicked me in the shins. You're not violent, but it might be something like that. Uh, Virtually, I would have kicked you in the shins. Exactly. Uh, how do you, I mean? How's it playing out for for you and the, the book and the story? The all this all, all sudden attention that, that with the with the Oscar. Oh, uh, it's bizarre because it's kind of out of body, right? I mean, we're in, we're still in COVID times. I'm doing a lot of things like this Zoom here, um, which I will say they approached me before the Oscars. So yay for the home team. Uh, people who are your real friends show up before the award. Um, in any case, yeah, it's it's been hectic and very busy, but it's exciting. The book is coming out in many more countries now. I think we're gonna be in more than 20 languages. Um, Linda and Swanky and Bob are doing great, which is fun to see. I got to uh, go out to LA to help Linda and Swanky get ready for the Oscars. And I felt like I was sending my elders to the prom. That was really cool. So uh, yeah, things are at once uh, different and the same, right? Here I am in my van cleaning out mouse shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, same, same, right? Uh, well, this time I've got mothballs. It's gonna get easier. Yeah. We're already getting some questions. We, we, we can start taking them and, and, and just, uh, uh, it just came up and it went away. Let me call it up again. Where are some of the people you wrote about today? Um, uh, Tamer asks. Well, hello, Tamer. Um, Linda May Baltland in Taos. She's really excited to do a bunch of homesteading, although uh, don't be disappointed. She is not building an earthship. It's not because she can't. It's because she doesn't want to. Uh, she's now in her early 70s. Linda just wants to have a place where she can come and show her family hospitality and chill out. So I say good for Linda. Uh, Swanky's on the road. Uh, she's been back doing her kayaking and her genealogy, which is her passion, just lots of family genealogy. Uh, Bob is bobbing out. He's come with he's come out with multiple videos on his YouTube channel um, since the film. And I know he's still serving as a, a guru and just an all-around really nice guy for a lot of people who are trying to hit the road. Uh, so those are the three people you might remember from the film. Exactly. And, and Carla asks, what are some of the greatest challenges of living in a van and being on the road? Sure. Um, probably the greatest challenge with a van is if the van is screwed up, it's not just your ride to work, right? It's everything. It's, uh, there's something really cool and joyful about driving around in what basically feels like an exoskeleton, like you can go anywhere. But the problem is when it breaks down, um, you really, really are stranded in a way that is hard to describe, describe unless you've experienced it. Uh, it's happened to me in this van. This van used to eat alternators like a champ, which is terrible. I've been stuck in Peoria, I've been stuck in Kansas. Um, and it, it's a very unique experience. Um, heating the van can be tricky. Um, well, those are two things. So I'll leave it at that. And and are you working on a, on, a, on a new book? 
somebody's asking. It's uh, uh, hey, hang on, wait, is that my agent, Joy? What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> she's, um, she's disguised as Eric. <laughs> er, Eric, curses. Um, uh, what I am doing is working on some new projects. Um, that's how my books start, though. They start as, as projects, uh, and I'm actually working on a few of them I'm really excited about. Um, and I can't tell you about them, which sucks, but that's the thing about being a journalist. Everything I do is, I mean, relatively low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, you could get a van and come out here and do it and scoop me, so I can't, uh, I can't talk about it. Even when Dale said I was going to Colorado, I was like, mm, I haven't told anybody I'm going to Colorado. Well, it's a big state, Jess. <laughs> it's a very big state. It's a very big oh, state. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, y y these things have to marinate these ideas, uh, but just being out there as a journalist is very important. And we tell our students that, you know, again, you mentioned earlier, you can overthink something uh, to the point where serendipity is our best friend. And it, as you travel around the next few weeks, you're gonna see things you couldn't, you could never even imagine. So that's, that's how it works. Yeah, sorry about those contortions. I was trying to get rid of the glare, glare and I failed absolutely, so I'm just going to ignore it. Um, the sun is moving on you. Of paper on the bottom of your screen if it's bothering you. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, like we tell our journalism students, you obviously have some kind of thesis or idea that something is going on that gets you out on the road, but invariably reality is much more complicated, contradictory, interesting than anything you could have speculated about while sitting at home behind a desk. So um, as somebody who likes to do immersion work, I can't tell you, um, Pfizer, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to Pfizer because this spring was brought to you by Moderna, Pfizer and Johnson and & Johnson. And uh, if I could wear a NASCAR jersey and they'd be my sponsors, I'd be all over that. Yay, science. Cool. Well, Frank asks, how do the nomads mm -hmm. receive mail and packages? Do they have a permanent address or PO mm -hmm. box, et cetera? Just, think, just thinking about some of the practical considerations of the lifestyle. Yeah, it's complicated, right? Um, some places you can still get things general delivery. I mean, I think technically you can get them anywhere, but I can't imagine receiving something general delivery in New York. So if I was in Quartzsite, Arizona, uh, you could write Jessica Bruder, Quartzsite, Arizona, and they'd hold it at the post office. Um, other people do rent temporary PO boxes, but that's only useful if you're going to be in an area long enough to receive something. Um, other people have their families uh, collect mail if, if families aren't on the road or maybe a friend will accept your mail for you or they use something that's called a mail forwarding service. It's a centralized location. All your mail goes there and they will forward it wherever in the country you wish. So as you roam, you can have your mail hitting you at different spots. It makes me think of through hikers on like, you know, the Pacific Crest Trail and stuff. You kind of hit these areas where you can restock. And then here's a more serious issue. Peter uh, asks, how do people access med medical care? Um, it's not always easy. Uh, when I was on the road, a lot of people, even if they technically could afford it, did not want to pay for it because the, their medical insurance was really faith that uh, they were not going to get sick. Because even if the monthly cost was low, people just felt like, it was a cost they couldn't absorb if they didn't know that they were somehow going to use it. Um, I also met people who were um, below the line, uh, just in terms of income, where you had to sign up for insurance, so they weren't doing it. So those people ended up uh, relying on charity care in different communities, and sometimes that was tricky. Uh, other people, I remember, would go to Los Algodones, Mexico, and that was fascinating. I went down there once myself, and we have something like 500 dentists squeezed into four square blocks. There are also eye care places, pharmacies with um, cheap medication, and uh, people go down there. It's, you know, you can walk across the border. They have great shrimp tacos. Uh, everywhere you go, somebody's playing a song by the Eagles. Um, it, it's really, it is a gringo hotspot, and it's fascinating because people get dental work there for pennies on the dollar because, as you know, in the U.S., we don't consider eyes and teeth to be part of the human body, which is really strange. I mean, I know you can see my eyes and teeth floating out of my head. They're not connected to my corpus, uh, but we treat them medically very differently. And, you know, I don't have eye or dental insurance. We can talk about that later, Dale. But um, yeah, so people go there to deal with it. And I'll stop rambling about it now. Yeah. They, they call it a tooth town, which I find uh, uh, cute. Or, or like Detroit Motor City, they call it the Molar City, get it? 
<laughs> you got to have a sense of humor. Uh, and that's the thing. People have a sense of humor. Uh, and it comes through in the book. Why do you think that is? I think humor is one of the best survival tools we've got. Um, it's funny. I think when people approach the book, they expect it to be all gloom and doom. And while the economic structure that these people are working in is pretty dark, the people themselves that I met were just amazing. Um, and humor is so important. I mean, it, it, it keeps us going. And it's something that I tried to bring into the book, uh, not as a way to trivialize people, but as a way to show their full humanity. These aren't people who just live in some sort of victim of the economy silo, and that's who they are. And they'd really resent it if anybody were to approach them that way, understandably. Well, Patrick asks, uh, are any of the nomad workers offered full-time jobs at Amazon, or do they prefer their freedom of part-time seasonal jobs? Um, prefer their freedom is a bit of a loaded phrase. <laughs> Uh, so I, as I said earlier, I did meet that one guy who was offered full-time work and he took it. Um, I don't think that's true for most camper force people. Um, Amazon's a weird beast anyway, because they often have temporary and full-time workers in the same place at the same time. It's a bit of a hunger games. So a lot of the people I met, camper force was what was available. It wasn't that People were saying, oh, you want to stay on? No, you want your freedom. Go be free. It was just like, this is what you signed on for. Uh, and when you're done, goodbye. You're plug and play labor, basically. And then here's an impossible question. This is how many fish are right. in the sea. How many people live this life out of necessity? Um, I wish I could tell you that. There's no nomad census or survey. And because most people do have some kind of fake address so they can get a driver's license, maybe mail, um, all that stuff. Uh, there's no way to tell. I mean, anecdotally, I would say, again, this is anecdotal, completely unscientific. I would say at least tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, but definitely tens of thousands. And um, what concerns me is what happens after the CDTC eviction moratorium expires. I mean, it's already st starting to fall apart a bit as it gets challenged in courts around the country. Um, but once people can get evicted again, I think we're going to see an upsurge in the numbers of people for whom a shelter is a, a vehicle is a shelter of last resort. And it's gonna to be tough on them and it's gonna to be tough on the people who are already out there because I think it may strain the ecosystem. Um, you know, So I'm, I'm a little nervous about that. Yeah, Matt Desmond's eviction lab at Princeton University predicts as many as 30 to 40 million people uh, face eviction. Now, yeah. probably that many won't, but even any fraction of 30 million is a lot. People. And people are getting evicted already, or, or, or what they call self-evicting, right? Where, where people know they won't be able to pay, and uh, they make the choice to get out. Dale, you met. Will you tell them about the couple you met on the road? Because, yeah, my, the most recent yeah. book I did, uh, it started when I met a couple digging through the trash in San Diego, where I was staying last year. They um, were getting bottles and cans, and they looked like they didn't belong. So I went down the drive and talked to them, and they became voluntarily homeless because it was a choice of paying the rent or making the car payment. And they couldn't afford to lose the car. So they were living out of the car. They were in their mid fifties for the first time in their lives. Um, and that was very early in the pandemic. Uh, and I met many more people when I started really seriously reporting who were in the same kind of situations. So it's not a choice uh, per se, like, oh, I wanna go be free on the road. It's, uh, I wanna save my car, which is I need to get to my job. I can't pay my rent. Um, it's not, not it's, it, that's not a, that's a, they call it a Hobson's choice. There's no good answer, but you pick the car because you, you need it for survival. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard, I, I think it's a sociological term to refer to it as constrained agency. The idea that you are exercising some decision making, but with so many constraints that other people not might, might not even recognize it as decision making. Okay, there's a lot of questions here. I might, I might skip around a little bit. The next one, though, is, uh, you know, why didn't Linda want to live with her boyfriend in a house? Do people get accustomed, accustomed to living in a van to the point where they can't live in a house again? Okay, you're talking about a fictional character in this question. Linda doesn't have a boyfriend who has a house. Uh, that's exactly. her in the movie. So I'm, I'm not going to speak to her motives because she doesn't exist. <laughs> and I've met Francis, but I haven't met Fern. So um, uh, I think you get to speculate because that one's fiction. It was fiction. Yeah, though in real life, and and it's not really getting used to it. I think, um, um, at least for my sense of reporting, uh, most most people will prefer the house. 
<laughs> I think people will go back to the house. I mean, when people visit, it's very common for them to want to sleep in their vehicles just because uh, they've been doing it for so long that it's more comfortable than being in someone else's home. But right. have the choice to have one's own home. Uh, and, you know, because once you live somewhere, it's not like you have to stay indoors all the time. We know this, but I'm out in a van right now and having the option to do this sometimes is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think given the chance to do that, uh, that is what most people I met would probably choose. Here, Nikki asks, when you were out on the road, was there any one odd item that you realized you wish you'd have had, but you never thought to bring? I was out on the road for so long that I'm sure I forgot things a billion times and replaced things a billion times. And, oh, here's one thing. Uh, how about a hot water bottle? I know it sounds really, really basic, but because I sometimes was parking in places where I didn't have, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, that's the hazard of uh, sitting in a van and having your phone in a holder attached to the window. Um, hello, hello? Hello, we, we can hear you, but cannot see you. I can't see you either, hang on, sorry about that. The perils of zooming from the road. I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm here. There you are. You're back. Hey, I'm back. Okay, I'm just going to hold it right now. And I can get rid of the glare, I think. Um, sorry, I, I should be giving you drama mean if I'm going to carry the phone around like this. Um, where were we before I dropped the phone? Um, um, yeah, we're talking, I think it was about choice and, and freedom. Oh, no, what did, what did I forget that I wish I had? The more oh, oh, we, so we moved on from that. What did you forget? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it, so it was a water bottle and I always thought of them as these kind of archaic things. Why would I use that? You know, I do have a ceramic heater I can plug in when I have access to power in the van and I have a propane heater I can use if I'm not sleeping. But then, you know, I wake up freezing my butt off and sometimes it's the old analog technology uh, that's the best. Uh, you know, Del Julia, my, my partner taught me about heating up rocks with iron in them on the stove and then putting them in the bottom of my sleeping bag, which is a fantastic way to A, feel like a baked potato and B, not freeze your butt off. Um, so yeah, I, I ended up buying a water bottle, but I think I've used the rock method a little more often. And rocks, you can't forget them, they're everywhere. Right. Now, here's here's a question I'm gonna adapt. Somebody's asking how this, your subject will, re, will react to older age, which I think means What's the end game for these people? When you hit your 70s and you're on the road, what, what is the end game for, for these folks? That's a great question. I mean, in terms of what I've observed, because the book came out in 2017, I've seen some people who are still out on the road, even as they get older and over. I've seen some people who ended up falling back on family, even though they might have resisted doing that for a very long time, in many cases, because they didn't want to be, they didn't want to feel like they were a burden on the next generation because often other people in their family were also having uh, financial uh, struggles. And, uh, you know, some people, a lot of people talk about buying a patch of land and homesteading or going in on one together. I've seen that happen a couple times. Uh, and then the other hard thing is some people do die on the road. Uh, Swanky, a couple of years ago, was at a campground and she was parked near a guy in an RV who apparently family or friends or somebody was coming to help them out. They chatted, got along really well. And then one day she was walking by and there were flies on the screens and it's exactly what you're imagining happened. And she had to call the coroner. Um, so that does happen. And I, I remember telling LaVon from the book about, about talking, talking to her about that. And she said something interesting to me. She said, well, I'd rather die out there than in a hospital with, you know, all this stuff getting pumped into my body. And that was interesting to me, just what uh, how different people see things. I mean, the attitude is we're all we're all going to die. Um, I, I think, <laughs> um, and, and that was her take on it, which is is different from mine, but I honor it. All right. In the in the movie, members of the community were regularly splitting up. Why did they stick together, moving from job to job? Wendy asks. Because they're all doing different stuff, um, and I think people reconnect at jobs, but a lot of people do campground hosting, but they don't do Amazon. And Amazon has sites in a billion different places. And people have places they want to go, people they want to see, other friends, sometimes family. Some people follow the weather. Some people don't care as much about the weather. It's really because there are just a lot of differences in personal preference in terms of the sort of work they're doing and where it is. Um, 
but they tend to meet up in the same places. So like we saw in the movie, uh, a lot of people were meeting up in Quartzsite, Arizona, um, it's a popular place. There's a lot of federal land there where you can essentially live cheaply or almost freely. You can go financially dormant during the winter when it's cold almost everywhere else. And a lot of the jobs are scarce at that time. Pauline asks, uh, in your book, you touch on how the overwhelming majority of the RVers you encountered were white. Would you say that the demographics are changing or still much the same? I think it's still overwhelmingly white, but I do think it's starting to change. Um, I had a long talk with that on the set of the movie with uh, Sharita, who is awesome. She was the one who in the film said her van is named Paint because it takes her where she ain't. And she's been on the road part-time and she was talking to me because she's black about what it's like both to be a solo black woman on the road, but also to explain it to her friends and family back home in Kansas City who didn't really have the same context for it that a, a lot of, I mean, RVing has traditionally been marketed towards white people. And uh, I know people are trying to diversify it. There are RVing associations for nomads of color, um, but I think it's still pretty white. Um, and it was, it was really neat to see Sharita out there and to hear her perspective. Uh, but when you think about it, when I was working on the book, it felt like every week brought a new headline about police shooting an unarmed black motorist. I was also spending a lot of time near the border with Mexico. They have these really creepy inland border checkpoints, which aren't even on the border. They're like a mile or so inland. And they either wave you through or they don't. Well, guess which white girl got waved through real easily all the time? Me. Um, would that be different if I were Latinx? Quite possibly. So I, I think that, you know, there are a lot of factors here, but one of them is also just plain and simple racism, right? Right. And, and we may see more uh, people of color because 80% of the people who face eviction, according to the eviction lab, are people of color. So yeah. I, it's, well, we don't know. That's speculative, but it, it appears that may be where the trend's going, you know. Okay, somebody wants a tour of Van Halen. I'm wondering, I know you don't want to show your, your back of your, your van, but maybe could you step out of the door and show the exterior? Is that- Yeah, you do that. The reason I'm not showing the back of the van right now, if, if you're curious, there's a, a blog, I think called Adventure Van Man, where they do a tour of my van years ago. Um, my van, because of the mouse apocalypse, uh, the mice had Burning Man in my van while I was away. Yesterday I cleaned and sanitized and laundered everything. And now I have to put it all back. Um, so it's a bit anarchic out there, but I will show you the van and maybe I can show you the solar panel that Dale helped me put in. So hang on. Um, I'm not wearing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hot. Don't burn your feet. The tarmac is really hot. Just to give you a sense of where I am. Is it all glare or can you see the Alamo Casino sign? Oh, it looks good. It looks great. Yeah, it's really hot. Um, all right. So you see my dashboard. I keep weird little bits of memorabilia on it that I find at bookstores and stuff. Uh, I don't know if you can see. There's another one that says love is not enough. That really cracks me up. Um, Dale, I still have our apocalypse. Uh, no, not apocalypse. Um, eclipse. Sun, uh, the glasses we wore for the eclipse when you were on the road with me in the van. Oh, lovely. Uh, those are on my... All right, really bright. You can see how it flared the second I came out here. All right, so it's going to be a little loud out here. But I'm going to walk forward so you can see it. This is my buddy, Halen. 19 feet long, that's a lot of long. Um, I don't have the pop top up right now, but if you see that line right there, that actually pops up and becomes pretty much a tent on top of a van. Unfortunately, uh, some little mouse shot himself out of a cannonball. There's a really nice hole in it right now I have to fix. Um, if you look up here, and I'm gonna try to get the phone on top of it. That is a 100 watt solar panel. It probably really needs to be washed. Dale, can you tell me if it needs to be washed? Yeah, it looks dirty. You're, you're not getting your full power. You have to yeah, wash I need, it Yeah, I need to wash that thing. Um, so yeah, this is the van. Um, I don't know what else to say. It's a van. I oh, like show us the much. license plate. Can you show us the license oh, plate? All right. So I did this before the movie came out, just because all the van dwellers were like, when's the movie coming out? And we were bored and thinking maybe it would never happen. So I thought this was funny then, but maybe it's a little conspicuous now. I don't know if I'd do it again, but here we go. Yeah. <laughs> the great thing is nobody has any idea what the hell that means. Um, 
that's I haven't been approached by anybody, which is how I like it. So that's pretty cool. I'll be curious if anybody recognizes it from the from the movie. So they, they use that in the movie um, promotion, didn't they? The plate. Yeah, they did. They used the NMD LND stuff on lots of license plates from all over the country, and um, yeah, uh, that was obviously after I had my plate. So. Um, Oh, I'm, Somebody I'm, might I'm, have a fangirl, and I am a Linda May fangirl, so that's okay. I'm, I'm bouncing around on the questions. Uh, one of them is about, uh, I, I'm going to interpret it, you know, are, 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 there, are the fan dwellers, the RVers, what are the politics? Are they political, apolitical? What's your sense of the politics of folks on the road? Uh, okay, again, I want you to keep in mind uh, that, and I'm going to disclaim this, this is a subset of people, and because I'm not a sociologist or a statistician, a statistician, statistician, I need that coffee. Um, uh, this is unscientific. And the people I met largely tried to avoid talking politics when they were around each other. I think it was a mix. I think there was a big streak of libertarianism, which shouldn't surprise you. And I think a bunch of them were what I came to call post-political in that they didn't think that the government was really going to help them. They didn't think the cavalry was coming in terms of who was in office. It might be same hand, different puppet, uh, just kind of a disenchantment with the system. Uh, although I know a lot of people were pretty pissed off about Trump. And the one person from the crowd I follow who posted online about casting a vote, many people don't get to vote because they're not near uh, the polls where they are registered because they're nomadic. But the one person who was talking about her vote on Facebook was Lavon. And she was a proud Hillary voter. So I think after Trump was elected, people said, okay, white older people, are these the people, are these the people who voted for Trump? And I was telling people, these are not the droids you're looking for. Right. Uh, I tend to find that people are, are they're just surviving. So they're apolitical uh, in general, but, but I never ask people's politics when I'm reporting on these sorts of things. It doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, and it's possibly that like wealthier RVers might skew more to the right. I just don't know. Also, because there are just lots of even within RV culture, there's a there are a bunch of different subsets, and I was really looking at one of them. So, here's a good question. This it's 2021, and how do people handle internet access, uh, which is oh, you have vital today. You can't live without it. Uh, you have to make appointments and do things. What do people do? Uh, they do what I'm doing. They use phones <laughs> right now, or they tether. Some people, if they can afford it, might get a little hotspot. But most people I know don't do that and can't afford that because it's an extra monthly fee. Um, okay. Unlimited data plans back when you could get those were just like a, such a boon to the community. And now I know a lot of people just try to ration their use, use their mobile phones. And I remember at one point Swanky uh, was upset because people kept liking her things on Facebook and somehow it, it told her and she'd go in and check and then she'd waste more bandwidth and she was saying, stop liking my stuff. Um, <laughs> So it, it comes up in different ways, but most people are on a phone. And sorry, I keep moving the phone. I'm trying to banish the glare, but it's just, it's, it's not following you. I know, I keep moving my hand around and it's everywhere. You want to be glared. Cambies asks, uh, me and I'm, I put it to us, considering your past reporting and writing on this topic, did you find what Jessica documented as inevitable and natural consequence of American capitalism? Um, putting it in a, in a, in a political, uh, uh, economic context, uh, capitalism. What's your? Uh, I have thoughts on that, but I'll, I'll answer after you. What do you? What do you think about? Oh, that? I want to hear you first. Well, <laughs> you know, it's it's. We all know we have the one percent. Uh, the last 40, 50 years, uh, uh, we've been on this free market economy binge. The all the protections that we instituted after the Great Depression to share the wealth. The average um, uh, CEO when I was a kid, made 40 times the average worker. Last time I checked, it was nearly 300 times on average. It's As of 2019, it's 320. And as of 1965, Dale, it was not even the 40s. I think it was like 25 or 21 till one. Right. And as I say, one can only eat so many donuts. So when you're making like, you know, 320 to one, uh, that ratio just is so out of whack. It doesn't make any sense. Right. And some states still have minimum wages of $7.25 an hour. Uh, I interviewed a fellow in Youngstown, Ohio, a couple of years ago, making seven twenty-five an hour. I, I, I can't imagine working for that 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 wage. Fifteen dollars an hour doesn't even buy you, rent you a, a place. So we've we've let the one percent concentrate the wealth, and there has to be 
it, it, it can't go on like this. The Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, a few weeks ago had a projection on jobs for the future. And in the bottom two quintiles of, that's 40% of Americans have, will have fewer job opportunities in 10 years. By the, and the by problem too is if you look at old school Republicans, they're practically today's communists. I mean, <laughs> in, in terms of where we are with that, because we were living in a capitalistic society back then. It's just things were divided up a bit more differently. Taxes were structured differently. Um, uh, the word that caught me in the question was inevitable because I don't believe anything is inevitable. I believe that, uh, you know, it's up to us to, to change things. It's our economy. It's supposed to work as a tool. We're supposed to be a market-based economy. Unfortunately, we've become a market-based society, which is pretty ugly. Um, and it's our job to right that ship. And Biden's talking about a lot of it. The question is, will it actually happen? Right. And will anything happen before 2024 when we're you know, at risk again of seeing another demagogue step up? Maybe somebody who's smarter than Trump, um, which is really frightening. Pre President DeSantis or Cruz or uh, you know, somebody from Fox. We're seeing here uh, questions about the, the this kind of leads to the uh, organizing at Amazon. And I know you don't want to be the Amazon reporter. It's, it's- Oh, it's fine. You just don't want to get pigeonholed, but I, I'll talk about Amazon, yeah. Yeah. I'm starting so, to think of Amazon as a metaphor for bigger things and then I, I get less. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. There, somebody's, several people have asked about the, the, the failure in Alabama of the union drive. When I, yeah. when I first heard about that drive, I thought that's the worst place to start a union drive in a yeah. right to work state, uh, historically has been anti-union. It should have been done in the North. But ha having said that, um, it failed. And, you know, why, you know, perpetual question is why don't workers see it's in their interest to, to organize? Uh, and well, Amazon, to oh. Amazon mounted a no holds bar uh, anti-union drive. They were hiring, gosh, I forget, there's some really Orwellian name for the subspecialty that these people practice in, and they're essentially anti-union public speakers. Uh, it's kind of like that 1970s scared straight stuff where they, they come in and people were sitting through mandatory meetings with these people. Amazon also did questionable things like having the ballot box put on Amazon's property, I believe. I think the NLRB is actually looking into some of this stuff right now. Um, because these union busting tactics, I mean, we know Amazon uses them. That Whole Foods video came out a few years ago, uh, which was just kind of insane. If you Google Whole, Whole Foods and union busting, you can watch it. Um, so I think that's a problem. I think also at a job, you know, at an Amazon warehouse, there's often a lot of employee turnover. That can make it hard to unionize too, if people aren't thinking about the long term and the future. It's a really depersonalized work environment. It's very isolating. So getting that sort of cohesion is tough. Um, I'm hoping that just that they got to a vote um, is a sign of momentum building for the future rather than a, a death blow. I, I think younger people are way more interested in labor uh, than my generation were when we were in our 20s. And uh, I think that's a helpful thing. Well, so, somebody's <laughs> taking me to task for saying a uh, President DeSantis would be great. Well, uh, uh, he would never allow the laws to be changed to allow workers to unionize more. Those laws were weakened over the last 40 years. And now a, a company can target somebody uh, and pretty much act with impunity. So it also takes federal laws that we're not gonna see from, the, from Republicans, right? All right, so we're at 20 minutes. I don't wanna be the killjoy here. I think we're at 4.30. Oh, we are. Okay. Wow. I, I didn't realize we're, we're over here. Uh, yeah. Do we have time for one more question or is that it, our moderator? Moderator, moderator, please come uh, on. We please. actually usually go until eight o'clock, um, but if you have to head out now, uh, that's okay too, but normally we go for another half hour. Oh, okay. My bad. I can hang. I'm sorry. I, I should have. This is the scramble of the road. Scramble of the road, and I had I had uh, technical challenges before we started, so I didn't I didn't reread the memo. Um, uh, now here's a question. This is something that I just saw a tweet from a guy in um, Montreal, uh, a journalist, and I put it outside my office door. When you um, report on the weak, you're called an efficacy journalist. When you report on the wealthy, you are considered a objective journalist. <laughs> and so somebody's asking about, you know, is this advocacy journalism? Uh, you know, 
I asked, uh, as there's a blurb in the book comparing your work to that of Jakob Rees and Upton Sinclair, do you, do you consider yourself an advocacy journalist? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I consider myself an immersion journalist. Uh, it's interesting. I, um, I, I hear that this reader has read the, or this person has read a blurb about the book, but I, I, that makes me wonder if the person read the book, um, because it's actually pretty important to me that what I do is not a polemic. And I'm going to leave it at that. Yes, you know, uh, there was a, the, the, the Archbishop of, of Brazil, Dom Helder Camara, said, when I feed the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. Uh, uh, I've had uh, editors call me, you know, an activist journalist. And I, I, just, I just tell stories. That's my job, you know. Um, uh, I think the movie succeeds in this dramatically because we just meet Francis's char character, Fern. We meet uh, the people and we get to know them as human beings. And, you know, we, we can see, but there for the grace of God go I. Um, so I think polemical is not even part of the vernacular uh, of what you or I do. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think the advocacy journalism thing, I don't know. I see that as a term that can be used to smear people who are reporting on things that are difficult, but. Yeah. But maybe that's not even what was intended here. And I use the term grace of God. Uh, Ted asks, are the nomads religious? Um, I'm not a couple people who are religious, by and large. It, again, it's not, uh, it's not a homogenous group. Um, so I think most of the people I met, I didn't seem to be church going religious or temple going or mosque going. Although I will tell you uh, the story of one Samir Ali, who is Macedonian and had a halal goat farm until uh, a drought essentially uh, pushed the price of uh, hay up and he couldn't sustain it anymore. He ended up on the road. He was a devout and practicing Muslim, had an app on his phone that helped him orient the man towards Mecca so he would know where to face uh, when he also used that same app uh, for the call to prayer. Uh, so I thought that was pretty cool. Some people, do, some people do have a portable faith. One of my former students, Randy, is here, and he asks, what was Frances McDormand really like? How political was she? How do you see her uh, from a perspective of your being a journalist? Um, I don't know Frances McDormand. Do you know what I mean? That's the, that's the honest answer, is I've seen uh, flashes of her, and um, I, I've never like sat down and had dinner with her. Um, so she was nice. I know she liked the book. I, I wish I could tell you more, um, but... I really, she's a person whose work I admire, who I, I don't really know. Right. Nobody's asked this. How did, how did the people in the, in your book who were in the movie react to the movie? Um, I'm curious. Oh, they, they were, they were totally into it. Um, one of the most fun moments uh, for me was getting to go out to Los Angeles in September, which some might argue was a bad idea, but I told myself I would only get on a plane uh, during that stage of the pandemic, if my sister, who was in Cali, had a medical emergency, or if the film finally came out, because it had been delayed a year. Um, well, that happened, and I ended up going out, and <laughs> convinced the studio to rent a convertible, because I wanted to have Los Angeles friends who helped me on book tour come with me, but I couldn't pod with them. So, there we are in Los Angeles with this convertible while ash is raining from the sky and a pandemic is going on. And yet there was something about being in motion that just made me feel better than I felt in months. I, I remember taking the top down and uh, putting on my N95 and listening to music with ash raining from the sky and then going to the Rose Bowl and getting to see Bob and Linda and Swanky and Sharita and Brenda and just all these people. And at the end, um, seeing them up on stage with Francis and Chloe to do the Q&A and everybody flashing their lights at the drive-in and everybody honking, that was really cool. Uh, and I, I know that they've felt pretty validated by the experience. Um, the one challenging thing that has come out of it is that people think Swanky is actually dead. Uh, I'm here to tell you that Swanky yet lives and she is doing great. Um, let's see, what, I'm going through some questions here. Uh, you know, uh, let's see, find a new question. Some of these have been answered. Uh, what, mental health, you know, how does people's mental health get affected by this? 
you know, there's the thing that I've seen, episodic mental illness. You're living really hard life. You're, you're in, you know, in, in, if you have a van or if you don't have a van, especially, it's really dangerous. So people have episodic mental illness, but how much, how, for the people you've seen on the circuit, how, how prevalent is mental illness? You know, so much of that is private that, again, I, well, when, when we opened the story with Linda and me in the magazine story, she was actually suicidal. Um, and she's a very, very steady person. This was actually before she got on the road, realizing she wouldn't be able to retire. She couldn't pay the bills. A lot of people I met felt that they were better off on the road because the system had just become so untenable at home in terms of just making ends meet and making it all work, that even though being on the road is precarious, it, it did feel like a bit of relief. Um, I did meet some people who were mentally ill and doing the best they could. Um, you do need to have a certain level of high functioningness, which isn't a word, um, to do this vehicle thing because there are, pun intended, uh, just too many moving parts. So I, I think if you are in a place where you have very, very serious challenges, the kind that might require constant care, um, that, just, that just wouldn't be compatible with, with being on the road. And Wendy asks the difference between, um, a lot of low-income people historically have lived in permanent stationary uh, trailers. Uh, what's the difference between them and the nomads? Mobility, <laughs> sorry, that's the obvious answer. I mean, but, but that's really the answer, M mobility. Um, they can move and go to different kinds of work. Uh, trailers are their own kind of racket. Often uh, you, are, you people end up buying the trailer, but not the land that it's on. I mean, they're kind of a money-making scam and uh, often, often uh, manufactured housing. Matt Desmond looks at that a bunch and evicted. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's really a different crew uh, doing a different thing. Because if you're, if you're in a fixed place, your employment is likely to be local if you have it. Um, the people I met, they're just going everywhere doing all sorts of things. Well, what, I think, you're, you know, they're surviving America as I think, did the subtitle say that? I, you know, I forget. I think there was something about surviving America. They're surviving America. Um, and and uh, let's see, uh, what else is here? Somebody asked a very basic question, which, you know, I, we throw this around a lot. It's actually a, a very good question. What is a narrative journalist? Sure. Uh, narrative journalist, again, I, I suspect you could ask three narrative journalists and get three different answers, right? Because uh, it's art, not science. Um, but the idea, at least, is to use the tools of literary fiction, plot, character, dialogue, um, all of these things, in order to create an experience that tells the truth, that is faithful to the truth, but is also as engrossing as that literary fiction, which is really damn hard, to be honest. Uh, if anyone here has seen the movie and um, read the book, you'll know that in the film, the character, Fern, Francis' character, goes out on the road after the company town of Empire collapses. I remember very specifically speaking with my editor about how amazing it would be if we could have as a through line character, somebody who ties empire to this whole kind of growing legion of nomads. And there just wasn't anybody, um, which made me th think a lot about what fiction can do that we can't. So we have these interesting truth handcuffs that we wear, um, but the upside is sometimes you can tell stories that I think wouldn't fly as fiction because reality is often a lot weirder. I mean, if, if, I, if I named the company town empire in a work of fiction, people would tell me that was heavy handed, right? as empire falls, the collapse of empire, all that. Well, the thing about uh, uh, narrative too is people allow us into their lives. I, I'm always humbled by when I spend time with people and sometimes as you did for several years, uh, how close you get to them. They become this, they're, they're not friends, but they are friends. Uh, they really reveal themselves. And uh, I feel a great uh, duty to tell their story properly, uh, you know, we, we got into politics a little bit, but I don't really care. I, I, in all the work I've done, I, I, I've never asked a question, what are, you, how do you vote? what are your politics? I don't care. I want to know how they live. I want to know how, where they came from. I want to know how they, they grew up. I want to know, uh, you know, what was it that set them on the road? What was the thing that went wrong? And usually it's a multiple. Uh, yeah, I want to see people in motion, like regardless of what point B is, that's not as interesting to me as how we got there from point A. 
Right. If that makes any sense. Well, when you, and when you follow a person like Linda May around the, the West, uh, you're 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 translating that into what uh, uh, Chloe Zhao saw in the book. It it's it becomes cinematic uh, by nature. You're you're in motion. So that's narratives. We're trying to basically be a fly on the wall of the inside of their van as they drive around. Uh, you, you couldn't do that, but you did the next best thing. You bought your own van and you went out and, and lived among them. And that's oh the God, only thing Imagine you if I tried to move into somebody else's van. <laughs> that would have been a hot mess. I think Linda uh, liked you, but the squeeze in was not big enough. For not the that much. Yeah, <laughs> nobody likes me that much. <laughs> so when I saw, this, when I saw the squeeze in for the first time in, in Arizona a few years ago, I couldn't believe how small it was. I, I don't think I could stretch out in it. I think it was that small. Um, she brought it to the premiere, which is really cool. She still has it. Um, I love that trailer. That's cool. I think that's great. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think we've gotten through. Oh, here's some more questions. Oh, showering. How the hell do you shower? That's a good uh, question. Well, uh, the first answer is less. Uh, they, with, uh, some people essentially sponge bathe. Others use baby wipes in between. Uh, other people, if you're in a place where you can be in nature and have some privacy, might get something called a Hudson sprayer or a garden mister sprayer or a solar shower, which looks like a giant RV bag. You fill it up with water and it heats up. Another really common trick is getting a cheap national gym membership, like maybe Planet Fitness, and uh, then essentially using that as a nationwide shower pass. That was something that Swanky was doing for a while. You showered at the truck stop. Oh yeah, I did shower at the truck stop. In Quartzlay, I took showers at the laundromat, which was cheaper, but they had a very strict limit on time and they would bang on the door. Uh, and every now and then after being, you know, in the van for like a week, I wanted to take a long hot shower. Um, and the truck stop was like shockingly immaculate. Um, but one of the most fun things on that trip was coming back and doing an expense report where I didn't have anything from a hotel and I was submitting to Harper's my shower receipt. So I was really proud of that. Okay, there's there's two interesting questions here I want to get to. Uh, 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 I'll ask this uh, so one first. Wendy asks, uh, the interactions interactions between the, the van life people and the nomads, and the van life people being young millennial types or younger than millennials who are doing this as a way of life, not as a, they're forced. Do they, they, do they interact at all? Yeah, and you know, I do think there's actually some overlap that is under-acknowledged. Under-acknowledged overlap, uh, because we like talking about fashion way more than we like talking about the economy. So when I think of hashtag van life, you know, uh, you think of those few influencers who are able to make a living off of blogging or getting sponsored by, I don't know, Yeti coolers or whatever. And that's really a fraction of the population. I'm sure there are, are many more people who aspire to do that than actually do. Um, in some ways, I think that van life is more of a brand than a movement. Um, because when people are on the road, I think they're doing it for a lot of reasons. And with a lot of the younger people I met, yeah, they were doing it. Maybe they had really hip inside insides of their vans. But a lot of them were dealing with similar, if not, you know, other really challenging economic circumstances. And it takes a lot of money to get a higher education in this country. It takes a lot of money to go to college. A lot of people either got stuck in debt or didn't want to go into all that debt only to graduate into a job market where they would never be compensated enough to shovel out. So I met millennials who uh, were almost conscientious objectors from the system in the way that some of the older people were. And again, keep in mind the balance between forced to do something and choice is a little more porous than we would think because it's really all about what choices, what options, what was your slate of options when you made that choice. Um, but I like to remind people that it's way more fun to talk about minimalism than poverty. Um, but I think it helps us if we can talk about fashion and the economy in the same breath because they do, you know, uh, these things are all impacting the culture at the same time, not in different silos. Um, so yeah, I met I met some people who would appear to be more like hashtag van lifers and um, really got along with the other people I was meeting and, and seemed to feel like they had quite a lot in common actually. So. Anonymous attendee asks, how do you two know each other? Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we've known each other for almost 20 we don't. years. Now. We've never, we've never met. Yeah, first time tonight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we met in the road. Um, no, uh, uh, Jess was in my class uh, in 2003. You were a part-time student. Uh, I was afraid to quit my, I was terrified to quit my day job. Yes. I was working in publishing as an assistant editor. Yeah. And like your, the fourth or fifth week of class, the story you did for me ended up in the Washington Post in the Outlook section, published. Uh, so it was a good start to your career, I have to say. Well, that was just because you kicked my butt and made me pitch it over and over again until someone took it. I don't think with, without that, you know, with... The butt kicking uh, was really helpful because it did get rejected a handful of times before somebody took it. And now yeah. I, when I teach, I, I try to kick butts in the same way. Yeah. And now we're colleagues. Jess teaches here at the J School with me. And uh, we taught together as well, as a matter of fact. So, yeah. and we've, we've traveled on the road together. Uh, we went to, to Linda May's place in Southern Arizona, which the, where the book ends, she's buying this patch of land. But, oh my God, is that place hot? There's no way she could stay there. That was the problem. Yeah. She didn't you know, consider the heat of the summer. Yeah, I mean, literally she built a greenhouse using PVC pipes, which is a totally reasonable thing to do. You've probably seen them before, those white kind of hoop house pipes. And when she was away, they melted in the sun. She came back and they looked like giant spaghetti noodles. Uh, and it was just, it was literally a hot mess. So um, I'm glad she was able to go somewhere else to Homestead. And then YT asks about sexual harassment. Oops, we lost Jess. So Jess can't answer that question. Let's see if she comes back. Maybe her battery died. Well, you know, I watched Jess go through this, this process. Uh, the, the idea actually, it was, it was in, our, in the classroom, we were teaching together when she had the idea. It was, we saw the article in Mother Jones and I followed her through the entire process. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the movie being made and what I think is beautiful about this story of Nomadland is it's somebody noticed it noted in the in the comments, you know, this is work from real people, working class people, you know, these are people like I grew up with. I, I grew up blue collar uh, in Cleveland. I'm not from a privileged back background. Um, and I like to think when I'm writing about uh, uh, the, the people uh, in my work, I'm writing about my uncle my friend in high school who worked in the factory. I worked in a factory for a little while. And so this kind of ground up reporting, to see it come full circle and in, in go into the popular culture, uh, the impact of that is, is so much more. Somebody asked earlier about advocacy journalism. If you're an advocate, you are shouting through a megaphone, but you're not really winning anybody over. When you read Jess's book or you watch the movie Nomadland, you're getting to know Fern, who's fictional, but you're also getting to know Bob Wells, Linda May, Swanky, who are real people. And the dialogue, just didn't talk about this, the dialogue, uh, a lot of it is what they really said, what really happened in their life. It's not screenwriting, it's, it's their stories. And so anything that makes us Bruce Springsteen talks about this. Uh, you know, the power of his music, uh, if he was, analyze, he was analyzing himself, is he's trying to bring people to, into the same tent. And yeah, we're going to disagree politically. Uh, I have my thoughts, you heard them, but um, I don't care what somebody's politics, and I've written about Republicans. I, I'm in, in equally sympathetic to people who are homeless or Republican when I learn through, when they just tell me they are, uh, as I am to somebody who's Democrat. We're all people out there in the world. We're not Democrat or Republican. And so I think that's the success of Nomadland, both the book and the film. It, it humanizes, um, uh, many big swath of Americans, especially older women who have fallen on hard times because of all the reasons Jess mentioned. They don't have as much work history. They get low, lower social security. Men have left them or died young and they're on their own and they're struggling to survive. So that's the power of the book. And I, I hope that comes through for those of you who've seen the movie and those of you who may yet read the book. So I think we'll, we'll wrap it there. Great, thank you so much everyone for attending today. We did record the event, so we'll be sending out the link to the email tomorrow. Um, if you had any trouble getting that, it is just gonna be on our YouTube channel, so you can go there and check out, basically all of our events are posted there after the fact. So thank you so much and have a great night.